Good morning, everybody. Uh, first patient is a 76 year old male who fell, has a left proximal humerus fracture. He was put in a sling. Next patient is a 69 year old male who also fell, the right proximal humerus fracture. Uh, he was put in a sling, he was neurovascularly intact. Um, he will follow up and may be a candidate for surgery. Next patient is a 95-year-old female, status post fall with a left distal clavicle fracture. She was put in a sling. Next patient is a 12-year-old male, status post throwing a football with a right humeral shaft fracture. He did not have a radial nerve palsy. He was put in a coaptation splint. Next patient is a 44-year-old male status post catching his hand in a machine. What do you think about your angulation on the lateral view? For the co-optation splint? Um, it's in valgus, um, which may be a little bit too much, but it should fall back into varus, hopefully. So it looks like it's you know a little apex anterior. Mm-hmm. Uh, next patient's 44-year-old male, caught his hand in machine with a left fifth-digit proximal phalanx uh, base and shaft fracture. He was closed, reduced, and put in ulnar gutter splint. Um, he did have a rotational deformity of the fifth digit when evaluating the cascade, but it seemed to be resolved after closed reduction. Jason, what... Just go back to that for a sec. Just on your post-op lateral, just explain to me where that, just kind of draw out where that fifth digit is and what kind of position the MP joint is in. Yeah, so this is the fifth digit here. Oh, sorry. Oh. Right here, there's like a little volar shear component, a little comminution there. Um, it could probably be in a little bit more uh, flexion. You know, I, it, it is hard to see with all the plaster, but to me, it looks like the majority of the volar articular surface is completely volar to the level of the metacarpal head. Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just concerned about the alignment of that. Yeah, I think uh, this, this would be a good candidate to consider uh, pinning uh, at a later point. Or maybe even just some additional imaging to get a better idea of what's happening there. You might mm -hmm. be looking at a fracture dislocation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with these really proximal fractures, it's better to do AP slabs than these ulnar gutter splints because it's really hard to flex the MP joints down and get a good x-ray when there's all of that plaster in the way too. Um, so your volar slab wouldn't come up past your MCP joint when you do that. It more of just immobilizes the wrist. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys still do those types of splints. I, I haven't seen them at conference very often anymore. This is a really unstable fracture. And based upon the, the severity of the fracture, and if this guy doesn't get moving, which is probably going to require some hardware, uh, he's going to get very, very stiff and his tendons are going to get stuck. So what, what tendon runs right over that fracture site? Uh, by FDS, FTP. Right. So your FTP tendon is, is very densely adherent there. So if you don't start moving the finger, especially the DIP joint, you're going to get, you're guaranteed to get tendon adhesions. So mm -hmm. this guy needs close follow-up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next patient is an 84-year-old female. Uh, status post fall with a right LC1 pelvis fracture, as well as a small anterior wall as tabular component.
And she was made protected weight bearing. Next is a eight month old female. Uh, she was found after being with her babysitter, unable to bear weight on the right extremity. Uh, she was found to have a right subtroke buckle fracture. Uh, she was placed in a spica splint or spica cast. Um, DCPP was initiated at the outside hospital from which she was transferred. Um, so they will, they'll be following that up at home. Next is a 21-year-old male status post football injury. Uh, he sustained a right knee anterior dislocation. Uh, on initial evaluation, he did have some numbness in the SPN and DPN regions. Um, his ABIs were initially 1.1. He was closed reduced under conscious sedation and put in a knee immobilizer. Uh, he was then observed overnight for serial neuro checks and ABI checks. Uh, he then received an MRI. He was found to have an ACL tear, uh, PLC injury, MPFL tear, and uh, his concern for a PCL as well. Uh, he'll be following up outpatient for a multi-leg knee reconstruction. So what order are you going to plan on reconstructing those ligaments? I'm sorry, one more time. In what sequence are you going to reconstruct those ligaments? You're doing them all at the same time. If you were planning the reconstruction, how would you think about it? Um, I would probably do them all at the same time. So I'm not a, a sports medicine doctor, but uh, as I recall, you usually don't want to do all of them at the same time. There's a high risk of stiffness, difficulty tensioning. It gets really busy in the center of the knee. So frequently, the more the greater priority to provide stability to the knee is, is what reconstructing what elements. Tom, Tom, let me let me jump in there. Thanks, KG. Um, been a while since your sports since your sports rotation uh the yep. pendulum has shifted a bit in that uh doing getting it all getting it all done um in one setting if you can uh is often recommended um and getting that done relatively early rather than delayed is typically recommended even though reconstruction is probably recommended over repair in many or most scenarios so meaning it used to be repair early, whatever you can, and then reconstruct the rest later. Uh, many would now try and get it all done in one setting. You can repair stuff while you're there, but you reconstruct everything, meaning PLC and uh, ACL um, and PCL if needed. And yes, yes, there's definitely a high risk of stiffness. Um, that's not necessarily considered a failure. That's considered part of the course and you, you just have to be ready to address that in perhaps 20 or 30% of people. Would you do an acute PCL, PLC recon or would you just try to repair it, if, assuming it's evolved off the fibula? So it's a good question and, and you'll get different uh, answers from, 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 from different surgeons, but there's a couple good randomized control trials that, that compare this. And even when you select out the best candidates for repair, meaning a very clean avulsion off the fibula of the PLC uh, and getting to those acutely, those patients often still do worse than an actual reconstruction. So th those there's two different studies that, that show this, that there's a pretty high failure rate up in the 30% if you just repair. So reconstruction really needs to be considered unless it's, I mean, absolutely a perfect repair. For the, that's for the PLC. For the PCL, if it's a bony avulsion, uh, 
uh, significant bony avulsion that's displaced, that one we'll try and repair. So this guy's a big guy from what I gather, and that's going to be a big undertaking. And, and um, uh, it may be one that gets sometimes just because of logistics, getting it all done. It can be a very long day. So we actually will stage it just for our sort of our own sanity. But, um, but, but we'll see what happens with him, what the plan is. With this perineal nerve intact, that's often a concern here. Yes. Okay, yeah, it's worth mentioning in your presentation that the, the perineal nerve was intact. Uh, next patient is a 87 year old female who jammed her toe. Uh, she sustained a left opening great toe distal phalanx fracture. Um, the nail bed was, was, was repaired and she was placed in a hard sole shoe. Next patient is a 32 year old male who was hit with a forklift. Um, and got a left this frame fracture. Uh, he was uh, put in a post year splint. And he will be uh, scheduled likely for uh, outpatient surgery. Good morning. First patient is a seven year old female. Uh, has this ball from monkey bars and the right radial neck fracture, proximal ulnar fracture. Patient was uh, neurovascularly intact, uh, placed in a posterior splint. Next patient. A 17 year old female presenting after a fall um, from skateboarding about a, a year prior to the presentation. Uh, then it's uh, right uh, capitellum, uh, sorry, left capitellum uh, fracture and malunion. Uh, on examination, the patient did have a, a block to flexion. Uh, range of motion was about zero to 80. Uh, CT was, for the, was obtained to further characterize the fracture pattern and for surgical planning. And it showed the uh, capital rotated about 90 degrees cephalad. The patient was taken to the operating room for uh, take that of malunion and the open reduction internal fixation of the capital. What was your approach there? Uh, so we did a lateral uh, approach, a uh, capital approach to the joint. Kaplan approach. So remind me of that interval. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, we basically split the. Um, uh, basically going through the encomius and the uh, ex accessor, uh, the common uh, extensor. want to try again? Going through the common extensor. No, no. For cat, either a Coke or a cap one. So we, we actually did an EDC split, but what, what, do we, what ligament did we take down to improve our visualization? Yeah, we'll, we'll stick down the um, lateral ulnar. We reconstructed it at the end. I mean, look, you Wait. can see on the lateral view there, the radius is not pointing at the capitellum. So, you know, that immediately is going to require some sort of ligament work. But, you know, with, with such a big amount of bone work we got to do, you got to see what you're doing. So, um, obviously, with a, with a fresh fracture, you want to try to avoid taking down ligaments and repairing them. But, but there's different, different ways to approach the, um, you know, the lateral side of the elbow. So it's important to know the difference between, um, you know, all the Ks aren't the same. So there's a cap one, there's a cocoa, and there's different intervals. So based upon what you're trying to get at, there's there's different, uh, you know, you, you can approach it differently. Yeah, just that, that, look, that looks great, guys. I mean, one comment on that, and that just goes to Dr. Coyle's point about gaining exposure, is sometimes a lateral epicondylar osteotomy is nice because that way you can reflect the origin of the collateral with a piece of bone that you can later fix. And that can really help improve visualization. Next patient is a 35 year old male, has a hand caught in lawnmower, presented with this uh, right uh, ring finger distal phalanx fracture, nail, nail bed injury, 
associated lacerations uh, like the uh, middle finger, the long finger and the small finger. Patient was otherwise in neurovascular intact. Uh, and the nail bed was, was repaired and the patient was uh, reduced and uh, placed in a, a volar slint for the ring finger, bulky dressing. Uh, patient did receive uh, antibiotics. Next patient, a 47 year old male presenting after a crush injury, uh, this right uh, small finger distance balance fracture, uh, associated mallet fracture. Uh, patient was taken to the operating room for uh, extension block pinning. Next patient is a two year old female presenting after a fall down the stairs, uh, presenting with this right salt to two distance figure fracture. The patient was otherwise neurovascularly intact and had no other injuries or signs of trauma. Patient was placed in a long leg cast. And by that. Thank you. Good morning. First, we have a right hand on a nine year old female. That's what's fault for the monkey bars. It's left knee on the condyle fracture. She's placed in a close ear slint and should have in the office. Next, we have a right hand on a 10 year old female. That's what's fault for the monkey bars. Uh, isolated left proximal radial shaft fracture. Uh, she's close reduced, close to a close fracture top slint. Next, we have a right hand dominant eight year old female, assessed with small blue monkey bars, left bone forearm fracture. She was slowly reduced, she was placed into a sugar tongue slint. Next, we have a 17 year old male, assessed with uh, uh, tackle uh, during a football game, it's left bone bone forearm fracture, uh, incomplete fractures. He's placed into a molded uh, sugar tongue slint. He'll follow up uh, closely in the office for reading radiographs to assess his place. And to the left hand down, a nine year old female, Seth was uh, fight during her sparring in karate. Uh, she jammed her right thumb and has this right uh, thumb P1 Salter Harris suit fracture. She slips into a close reason, plays into a psycho cast, like a slit department. Next, we have a right hand down, a 13 year old male, uh, Seth was tackled during football, uh, in his right fifth metacarpal neck fracture. He's close to use and puts into a polar bear slint. Next to our right hand down the 30 year old male, um, punched the wall, since right foot got carpal shaft fracture, no decisions, uh, had an injury uh, one year, uh, almost one year exactly prior, uh, with the same mechanism uh, with the fracture to that right uh, fifth metacarpal shaft. Fish noted that he uh, had a deformity. To the, to, the, to the hand, but no functional deficits, no noticeable functional deficits. It's placed into a, an owner better slint. Next, we have a Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark, can I interrupt you for a sec just to go back? Do you think that that was a non union that he injured, or do you think he just fractured in the exact same spot? And then just critique your reduction. Yeah, so I think that. Um, so he probably, probably at least had a mal union out of the, uh, or, or some sort of fibrous partial union of the bone. Uh, and for this, when I uh, measured, uh, I got anywhere between 38 and 41 degrees. Uh, so just on the cusp of the in the, the fifth metacarpal, knowing that he probably had some deformity prior to uh, me meeting him. I think I would get it in a better position to close. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to know what happened before, but my take is exactly that. Something happened previously, maybe he had a fibrous union, and that may be why you were unable to bring that back into extension. Now, if he heals that way, it's fine, but you, know, you got to think if that's a delayed or a non-union, why did it occur? Next is a 74 year old female, says was a ground fall. It's left LC1 pelvis fracture. Uh, no decision had a total hip on the right uh, from two years ago, DHS on the left, uh, 
20 years ago. Uh, the patient's been protected weight bearing. And, uh, protected weight bearing. Protected weight bearing with the walker. So that means uh, she's able to um, bear weight uh, with, with the walker assistant or, or some of their assistive, assistive device. Um, that is from the same year old female with a crown such as crown fall, surrounded to be able to rust and fracture of no shape, chronic extensive mechanism dysfunction. Uh, and uh, at this time, patients immediately, patients may not weight bearing, place into a knee immobilizer, uh, should we progress to weight bearing and extension of the hinge knee brace? Thank you. Morning. This case is a 12 year old female uh, with a right Salter Harris for disorders fracture. We presented at a hand conference last week. Um, this was actually her initial x ray. She was seen first by an outside orthopedic surgeon that diagnosed her with what was presumed to be a Salter Harris 2 disorders fracture. Their x ray at one month, showing some step off of the articular surface. So her x ray at two and a half months, at which point she was referred. Us. The CAT scan was obtained that did show about five millimeters of step off the articular surface. And at this point, was a patient specific osteotomy utilizing patient specific guides. It's done. Here are some intraop photos showing several of these guides um, that show. Um, the osteotomy cuts, as well as some guides for the plates. Some intra-op photos here as well. And then here are photo shots showing the reduction after the osteotomy. This case is a 17-year-old male who so has a full injury with a left radial shaft fracture. It's closed, there's no relaxation intact. Taken for a radial shaft ORIF. Next patient is a three year old female, Cessna's fall from monkey bars with a right lateral condyle fracture. It's placed about three millimeters. It's taken for a arthrogram and CRPP. Next case is a five year old male, Cessna's fall from trampoline with a right dislocated bubble fracture. It's placed into a long leg cast and by valve. Next case is a 15-year-old male status post uh, hit from behind while playing rugby with this right shaft fracture. He was closed, reduced, and placed into a long leg by valve cast. It's a 57-year-old male status post MVC with a right proximal fracture. So actually intact. And he made not only bearing the sling. And this is an 80 year old female assessed with fall with a left proximal humor structure. That's fantastic. First case is a 16 year old male, uh, wide receiver who collided with another athlete, sand his left clavicle fracture. He's made non weight bearing of sling. <laughs> this is a 16 year old male assessed with collision, also in a football practice, out with a left proximal humor structure. He's made non weight bearing of sling. Do you probably help that at all? I think it will. Would you think about suspending him in a, gra in a uh, hanging arm cast or something like that to realign it or just give it time? I mean, I think it would be, I think that if it feels where it is, it would be fine. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know how much it will like having a hanging arm cast. Uh, it's not be that uncomfortable. Is that what you would consider? I, in this kid, I would. Okay. Given that he's a little bit older, if you want to try to get rid of the parents, like you said, it's not going to be a problem for angulation. I've seen him heal far more than this and be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but at 16, his vice is, you know, probably getting closer to closed, but this is a salter or two. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that, I don't know, probably hang. Uh, next one is a 21 month old male who got his foot caught on the slide and had his right uh, spiral tibial shaft fracture. He was placed into a long leg by belt cast. Is a 63 year old female, status post fall, tripped over her cat while carrying laundry down the stairs, has a left proximal humerus fracture uh, that was felt to be 
unstable and should see if we're allowed to properly be right to RIF. How did we do it? Is that any arm? Any arm? Yes. <laughs> you can try. I <laughs> might be able to. Yeah. That's uh, not that far off. She so, is, how is she unstable? Uh, it's kind of hard to appreciate, but she was 100% displaced anteriorly. I think that's the reason right there. You can see it on that. Uh, you know, step fly view yeah. that she's translated. And so what do you worry is gonna kind of lead to non-union. So yeah. what's in the way? Why is it gonna reduce? That what, what's in the way? What did you have to move out of the way when you reduced it because you opened it up? Yeah, so it's it poking through our delta fat fascia there. Yeah. And where was the biceps? Was that biceps in your was, way? was medial to it? It's medial, okay. Mm -hmm. It's inside the fracture. Yeah, thankfully not this one. Well, uh, that's your 16-year-old from uh this one yeah so let's say you you plated it in situ in that position mm -hmm. you put it with it. would you be satisfied with that reduction um probably not what would you say like what's wrong with it uh it's in too much bears you think he's going to remodel a little bit obviously he doesn't have too much growth left but he does have the open places there I would look at his other shoulder too on the side. But I think he's in, I think it's embarrassed. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm saying that is I, I have a kid who got referred to me and he was treated for something very similar to this. Mm -hmm. He healed in Barris and he's never been happy with the function of his shoulder. So mm -hmm. we take these old middle-aged people who are, you know, get these comminuted proximal humerus fractures and we debate, you know, put we put the plate on so they don't heal in Barris. But you take a 16-year-old athlete, you let him heal in Barris. You say you're going to be okay, and this this kid is not okay. Uh, you do a, a valgus osteotomy or something like that. It's a whole other story, but it depends on his level. He's probably going to play collegiate sports, and he's never been happy with his shoulder. So, having that experience, would you wait to see if the seals, or would you do something acutely? Well, one thing I would do is that I would do what Dr. McCartland said. I did because of that, I'd be more aggressive with the hanging iron caps mm -hmm. and try to get it to reduce a little bit better. And I, you know, again, I'm telling you an N of one, somebody who's not happy. There's a thousand of these things that feel like this, and the kids have been very happy. But yeah. It's just, I find it, it's getting interesting, the fact that we're so critical of our middle-aged and elderly people and not letting them feel embarrassed, but we're letting kids feel embarrassed and say that the shoulder can handle it. At curiosity, what position did he play? He was a lacrosse player. Okay. And football, for that matter. This guy, this guy was a lineman, if you know, matters. Everybody's got to get their arms over their head. It's production for you guys. Yeah, I wonder what the true end is. Uh, I, mean, I agree. I think it's a dominant pitcher. You know, dominant pitcher. But I wonder what the true end is because I mean, I don't know. I've had a lot of kids that feel just like that. Obviously, I don't hear back from them. So those guys might be later on. You know, in the years later. But I guess in our team world, I definitely see a lot of these people are great. They're happy afterwards. They don't look at us anyway. But who knows if they graduate from us in 20 years. We're publishing a study uh, that Dr. Sewell and Newark kind of piloted, and it was basically showing you know 50 different radiographs to 12 or 50 orthopedic surgeons and whether they could fix them or not. And there seemed to be a lot of consensus around the older patient with varus like this to close the and pin, not to open it. You know, a lot of them you can pin for fix it for two weeks and they'll stay. But I also think that this is one that you can give a little you know, kind of a cross arm, you know, traction maneuver to, and they will get better, and then you put them in the hanging arm cast. Probably solve the problem. I can also admit that I've had some severely displaced ones that either open or close reduced or pins in it, and it looks like that. <laughs> and I accept it with, with pins in it after uh, close reducing really severely displaced ones. In the OR, looking at a blur with pins across that after it was completely displaced, I'll admit I've taken that. Uh, next one is a 57 year old female, Sassos NBC, left distal radius fracture. Non displaced, she's placed into a cervical splints. As a 27 year old female, status of crush injury uh, from a shelf, they a small thing or metacarpal base fracture. She was placed into an ulnar gutter splints. The 57 year old male who was trying to teach a uh, kid soccer and did a bad job and has a open left index finger PIP. Uh, dislocation. 
uh, it was washed out, open reduced, uh, it was given antibiotics and placed in a lumen foam splint. So what was in the way? Uh, so the bullet plate could get incarcerated in there. What was in the way in this case? Uh, of reducing it? Yeah. Nothing, I mean, am I right? Oh, when you open it up, see so the dorsal approach? No, this is just the oh, open. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. you said open reduced. It made it sound like you did. You uh, something. Sorry, no, it was just already open for me. Okay. <laughs> so how long <laughs> you did you give? How long did you give that piece of antibiotics for? Uh, just a few days. Okay. I, I don't know if it even does anything, honestly. But we gave him the ER. It's an open joint, so yeah. I wouldn't ignore that fact. Tom. Go back to your uh, injury film. So in theory, what could be in the way here? Uh, bowler plate could be in the way. Yeah. Um, your FT uh, P tendon could be in the way. Well, I don't call it. It's going to the radial side, so the, the uh, bottle band could be in the way too. The 61 year old female uh, got her finger crushed by the back of a table saw, has this open left middle finger tuck fracture. It's washed out, uh, nail that was repaired. Sent on antibiotics. It's a 91 year old female, status post fall with a right LC1 pelvis fracture. She's made protective weight bearing with a walker, which she already used at baseline, and is placed on DBT prophylaxis. There's a 69 year old male, very active, who <coughs> fell on his bicycle and sustained this left femoral neck fracture. Um, an extensive conversation was had with the patient, and we discussed his treatment options. Um, and basically, going into surgery, our plan was to first put him on a fracture table and see how the hip reduced. And if we were satisfied, we would pin it. And if not, we would go to a total hip. And we were satisfied with the reduction, and we opted for the cannulated screws. So, are there studies for both the outcomes of these kind of fractures? Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of literature, both for and against doing this. Um, there is a study that I found out of China five years ago showing the risk factors that affect ABN in patients with displaced femoral neck fractures, and they found that age and uh, procedure delay in terms of uh, delay to OR time from the injury uh, and screw configuration did not affect the risk of ABN, but factors that did affect the risk of ABN were the initial garden classification of the injury, uh, but the most significant was the residual post-operative displacement of the fracture. Um, so this patient is definitely at higher risk of ABN than a non-displaced fracture. And in another study I found, it looks to be about a third of patients went on to non-union or ABN who were 70 years or older, which this guy's 69, but uh, basically in that age group. Um, and for highly active individuals, I think that if you have a conversation with them up front, that their revision rate to arthroplasty would be significant. Um, and the study I found is around 26% revision to arthroplasty within two years. Uh, but you want to give them, this high functioning person, as much of a chance to continue with their level of activity. Uh, our patient understood that, so we went ahead with this. So you're yep. saying if you got a total hip, you wouldn't be able to bike? Not that he wouldn't be able to, but uh, you know, he would be able to have a more native hip and more native function uh, if this heals, and then also not have any of the complications that come with having a total hip. Uh, which are what? Dislocation, uh, prosthetic joint infection. Depend that depends on the approach somewhat, correct? So, so what are the rates of uh, complications with this procedure? Give me ballpark it or give me the numbers that you think you have. So for ABN, it's around 30%. Uh, 
Um, less. It's less than 30. Less. Yeah, but the non-union non avian rates haven't changed no, no matter the techniques or what. Most of them say it's in 20s for both combined. So he has a 20 something, 20 to 30% chance of either getting avian or non-union. What are the, the percentages of dislocations of hips, of total hips? Uh, it depends on the approach, but it's between like one to two percent. Okay, so is that are those numbers different? So you're you're saying he's you're trying to prevent the complication of a total hip, but you're giving him a tenfold increase in complications after this procedure. But you're you're comparing all hip fractures. Asnes did a study out of Long Island that showed a much higher rate of union. And he presented a case here with his no comp, no, doesn't appear to be comminution, anatomic reduction. The only problem, I, I would have put the screws in a little further, but if you can put the screws in further, get compression, no comminution, anatomic reduction. The Asnes study, study showed that the rate of non-union and malunion or AVN is significantly less than what you're quoting because you're taking all comers. And obviously if this is comminuted, and poor fixation and not reduced, then when you add those in, then you get that 20 or 30% number. But it's still going to be higher, even if you get the best chances, it's still higher they, they, than they had 90% of the location. They had 90% union. And who wouldn't want, who wouldn't do an operation for 90% union and have their own hip on something you don't have to open? Obviously, if this is comminuted or you didn't reduce it anatomically or you got terrible fixation, then, I, then nobody would do this. But this is one of those rare cases. I, I think they did a great job. And I don't know that anybody in the room who's 69 or 65 or 70 wouldn't want their own hip under these circumstances. What's the post-app rehab going to be? You know, obviously, so, with the total hip, you're going to walk right away. So how long yeah, are they so, going to be partial weight bearing for? So we're going to make them partial weight bearing probably for six weeks and then progress them. Yeah, so know. What's the complication rate of a total hip um, involving a revision like this with a hardware removal versus, say, a primary hip? I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, is it higher if you're, if you're taking screws out and, and putting in an implant? I don't know either, actually. Depends. I think it depends a little bit on how it fails. They, like, completely cut out. So, well, that the, the FATE study, which was the largest study, of the, the randomized trial for these, uh, which it looked at these... They look at young femoral necks, but if you're the reason you're doing this procedure is you're calling this guy physiologically young. That's why you're trying to preserve his hip. If he was poor candidate, you wouldn't have even done this. So if you're calling him, if you take the the fate study, you the displaced femoral neck fractures tend to do better with fixed angle constructs, not cannulated screws. Um, but the if you use the fixed angle construct, he's more likely to go uh, need a total hip versus to uh, have a malunion and heal that way. So why do you select the cannulated screws? I'd say uh, you were very happy with the reduction, which is great. Yeah. Then why the, did you choose the implant versus the other? The, the cannulated screws was the Italian preference. So we did talk about doing a fixed angle construct. Hey, Serge, if you were going to treat this case with an internal fixation, would you open it or do it closed? I usually try closed first, similar like the way this was, because some of these non comminuted you the reduction maneuver you flex the hip and internally rotate, and that apex anterior will line up and then get multiple views all around, because some people will argue that no matter how good it looks on floor, if you open this, which some studies have done, there's always a degree, one millimeter, two millimeter of malreduction or rotationally, it, it doesn't line up. So it's not a perfect reduction, but I would usually on floor or close reduce it. If I'm happy, then would fix it. If not, then would open. I'll just jump in and give you two cents here. And and what, one of them is that the real key is that inferior screw. And sometimes what I'll actually do is put the guide wire in, get it where I want it, and then put the screw in, make sure my threads are distal to the fracture and get good compression. And then go ahead and put the other two screws in. 
So my question for Todd is that this inverted pyramid construct is what's recommended. Why don't we go the other way and just make a pyramid or a triangle with the screws? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. You asked why we do an upright triangle? Yeah, why do you do an inverted pyramid just instead of the uh, instead of a regular triangle there? Uh, I think just from the biomechanical studies that have been done, um, I don't have any to quote for you today, but uh, showing that it was the most average uh, constructs. What's the motivation? Uh, you know, it keeps uh, again capturing that impure cow power and uh, prevents it from collapsing into Paris. So the forces that are going to cause it to fail are various forces, right? And where is your strongest bone? I uh, fear uh, posterior. The cow car, okay, but to resist tensile forces, okay, it's on the wrong side, right? That subchondral bone in the femoral head, you're not going up all the subchondral bone, but that's weight-bearing bone, it's pretty strong. And, uh, you know, this also decreases the crowding that can take place around lesser stroke and decrease the risk of a pathologic fracture. Uh, so having two screws, you know, with compression at the tensile component is what prevents it from failing. Yeah, uh, that's that's a better explanation than I could have given. But the other thing is, is that if you put two screws in very close proximity, inferiorly, you can fracture between the two screws, and then you're at a risk for a a fracture in the peritrochanteric region. So if they're very spread apart, you might be better, but I think the risk of iatrogenic fracture is why you want to go with the inverted pyramid. Gotcha. It just, I would just, again, re reinforce, put the screws in just a little further. I mean, everything here looks perfect, but the screw threads are right at the fracture line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, next patient's a 64 year old female, sash was fall, the right patella fracture. Uh, she had a CT scan that showed that there was, a, in addition to the transverse component, a sagittal split in the inferior pole, and that there was a significant articular step off in the fracture. Uh, she did have an intact extensor mechanism, but due to the uh, articular step off, we did recommend surgery for her. She was taken for a right patella oria with a tension band construct and a live sewer process sagittal slit. Is there still a step off there? Uh, about a millimeter. This is a 20 year old male who was a pedestrian struck while riding a scooter and had a left tibia and fibula shaft fracture. Closed injury. He was taken for a left tibia eye and nail. Thank you. Good morning. First patient, a 64 year old female, uh, status post fall several weeks after uh, right total of arthroplasty at an outside institution uh, with a right Vancouver B2 periprostate femur fracture. Uh, she underwent revision uh, total of arthroplasty with a uh, long back seal uh, engaging stem um, and uh, surplage right there. Uh, next patient is 62 year old male, status post fall. The left uh, femoral neck fracture, healthy, active male. Uh, he underwent a left total hip arthroplasty. Next is a 62 year old female, set post fall, the left uh, femoral neck fracture. She underwent a left total hip arthroplasty. Morning. Uh, first patient was a 12 year old female who fell, um, stepping off the curb and sustained this left triplane ankle fracture. Uh, she was closed, reduced, and placed into a long leg cast that was bivalve. Uh, next patient is a 55 year old gentleman who fell from the ladder. Um, uh, presented in an outside hospital, um, was supposed to follow up, and then um, missed some appointments, and then 
um, was finally referred to a uh, foot and ankle specialist. Um, he had this uh, left calcaneus fracture where CT imaging um, uh, was available from his initial injury, um, showing a uh, Sanders free calcaneus fracture. Um, he was brought to the operating room for a left calcaneus open reduction and internal fixation. Was it easy to move everything around after five weeks? Um, not really. <laughs> um, it was a lot of pressure to use. Um, use the sinus for approach. Use sinus tarsi for a five week old. approach. Um, uh, I think there's actually studies that recommend if they're more than two weeks, you may get better reduction with the extensile lateral. Sinus tarsi is great for acute calcaneus fractures, they're, they're, but reducing things is more difficult through that approach, especially if there's already healing. Uh, good morning. First patient is a 74 year old male assessed with crush injury. Uh, specifically, he was using a bow, and the uh, bow came and struck his uh, thumb after the arrow was fired. So his left thumb open, a uh, tough fracture. This is again soft tissue injury, goes to him radially. Uh, was nervously attacked, was trapping from the distal uh, fingertip. He was taken to the operating room for irrigation debridement. Uh, uh, where where was the insertion of the FPL with that case? Was it with the volar fragment or was it still attached? Uh, it was still attached uh, uh, volarly. Uh, there was some combination uh, there uh, and there was uh, one other fragment that uh, had a little bit of FP, uh, FPL attached to it, but there's still a feel attached uh, to uh, the majority of the remaining fragment. I have a remaining like uh, piece proximally. It, so it was attached, still attached to the proximal fragment? Yeah. Interesting. Where, where did you put the Integra? Uh, dorsally. Well, where, where dorsally? Is the nail is dorsal? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it, it just abutted. It's kind of like. For allow for epithelial for epithelial tissue to grow. Um, is there is there is the tendon is it, you know on top of the tendon you put it? Uh, not not on top of the, the tendon. There was like a little bit of like soft tissue uh, there. Uh, there was like a frank exposed uh, tendon. Uh, so what, why did you use Integra? I just to promote uh, epithelial tissue forming over the uh, recover just to. To give it the best chance to, to heal without a uh, complication. Wouldn't it just granulate in though? Was there a, a I, surface exposed that should not uh, allow granulation? I think, I think you could have, I think you could uh, let it heal by like, like secondary intention, like granulate in, but I think the Integra uh, this covers it, you know, gives it the best chance to make sure there's not a problem with on. But I so, think you could have not used it. So in that spot, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's proximal to the base of the nail. If someone had a chronic uh, a paronychia and you did marsupialization and excised all that skin, would, in, would people put Integra there? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they have paronychia if there's an infection. No, no, I'm saying if, if you treated it by excising all the skin there, what happens three or four, three or four weeks later by excising all the skin proximal to the nail? I, it would, it would in. Yeah, it, fill, it fills in in a few weeks and you yeah. get skin. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, Tegra is great, but I, I don't know about where, where you put it. Whether it's helpful. Yeah, not not being a hand surgeon, but if if you're presenting that on your board, like why did you do that? It's a terrible expense. What's the point there? Either leave that out of your presentation or better yet, be honest, don't, just don't do it. 
unless you can explain it. Our next patient is a right hand dominant 57 year old female, uh, stats with uh, MBC, and this right closed distal radius fracture, nerve actually intact, no red close reduction. Uh, it was uh, still uh, seems a depression uh, and loss of radial inclination, and the uh, volar carp was a little bit translated volarly. Uh, was taken to the operating room for a uh, external fixator uh, with. Um, bird cage pinning with fracture. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, these are her radiographs. They found that there was an unappreciated uh, distal uh, radial shaft fracture uh, that uh, pins uh, went through. Uh, the specialist had a patient about uh, uh, revising this. Uh, how the decision was made jointly was just to observe it closely and see if there's any sort of uh, displacement of that radial shaft fracture. Uh, the plan is to treat this uh, without any further intervention uh, to see if this will maintain reduction in this position. Have you done anything else, Dan? Are you worried about it? So you have that, you have that pin through the fracture fragment and potentially disrupted feeling, maybe lack it together. I mean, you can't lack because the technique's wrong, but maybe you've stabilized it. Um, is there anything else you could add here? Uh, revising the XFIX? In addition to the XFIX. No, so if we were in a revising, we would uh, take the XFIX down and do like a long lower approach to the right after the get move the pin more proximal and you maintain it that way. There's been a couple points, but get it off early. Uh, the idea here is early motion and you, know, you, you could, uh, the pins are extra articular, so you could theoretically still have them in, but you can also just put a cast over this or plaster and address the radial shaft fracture too. And that's an option. You just make a window for the insights. I had to do that for little kids with issues with um, uh, blounds when we're using external fixators. Uh, if they're uncomfortable, it's spatial frame of less and less, but you can always add plaster here if you wanted to. Did you put the K wires in after the X fix was applied? After, uh, so we uh, was the alignment of the uh, of the wrist good after the X fix was in on. Uh, it, it was good. The alignment we use uh, capanche and a couple of things just to elevate the the dorsal uh, combination is the elevate elevate that dorsally up. Um, but other than that, like the alignment uh, was good after we put the X fix on. And and you didn't see the fracture where the proximal uh, pins were put. No, we didn't. We took separate shots you know, of our pins in after we had placed them and didn't appear to have a uh, fracture uh, when the pins were in. What, what, made, what made you decide to use an X fix instead of a plate once you decided to fix this? Uh, so there are a lot of the higher, the higher injury, a lot of different uh, fragments. Uh, so if we had opened it, uh, we would have to use some fragment specific fixation and there's a complicated fracture pattern and it's the Italian preference to use the X fix. So you feel like you could use ligaments taxis to get the inadequate reduction and lock it in and use uh, these pins just to maintain a good radial inclination and maintenance of the articular surface uh, percutaneously with those pins. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to be defensive. There's nothing wrong with an X fix. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. And then whether or not you need those K wires, that's a little controversial because you reduced it without them, but some people put them in. I, I agree with um, just using a splint for a period of time to let that heal. And I, I would, since you have the wrist pretty well aligned, I'd leave it the way it is. Morning. I share my screen or is not sure. Yep. So, uh, first patient's a 12 year old male. I'll screen the ball off the bike with the left type three uh, extension of the type. Scratch here. Uh, Neurovascularly intact with a good pulse. Uh, but did have left radial 
Uh, he was taken that day for a left elbow close junction percutaneous pinning. This is an 81 year old uh, female who underwent a total hit uh, two months prior. She was noted that her uh, she was still having pain two months later, and it was noted by the physical therapist that her leg was significantly shorter than the other. This is her post op uh, two month X ray showing a Vancouver B periprosthetic hip fracture. She was taken to the operating room for a revision, total hip arthroplasty with a long set. Jimmy, what do you think happened? It was, it was probably an intraoperative calcar fracture and she had to decide to do that. This is a 74 year old male um, who had a hip hemi arthroplasty about uh, 20 years ago. That was revised to a total hit. He sustained a fall, uh, now sustaining a left Vancouver B periprosthetic hip fracture. He was taken for a left hip explant revision total hip arthroplasty for his femoral component. So the actual component came right out, but that bullet and his bullet was difficult to get out. Yeah. I don't know that design is that. Was it said it was an old one? Yeah, yeah. When do you put the surclage? When do you put the surclage around? At what the, point in the operation? The distal surclage is prophylactic, and the proximal two are just around that lesser piece. Um, it's not an anatomic reduction, uh, partially because you need to do. A proximal reamer uh, in order to make room for those, but we uh, we did not use that proximal reamer because uh, we did the surplus after the uh, instrument was made. Are you able to take the implant out initially um, easily, or or do you, you know do you have to do an osteotomy or displace that to get the implant out? Like right there. Can you uh, we, get the so the implant slid right out. This implant slid right out, but that bullet that's in there distally is a separate piece. So we had to book open the fracture in order to get that out and use osteotomes. Oh, okay. Space is difficult here. I have stuck to the skull with left ankle femoral equivalent fracture. The stress x ray show uh, opening of the medial size locations open reduction of the presentation. Next patient is 85 year old female, subspace blood level 4 with right hip uh, IT fracture. The patient was taken to the OR for right hip. Uh, I am made. Thank you. Morning. <clears throat> First patient is a 24 year old female who's involved in NBC with a left open radius fracture. She's closed reduced in ER. Taking the following morning for a distress IND or F. Next, a 56 year old female who fell down one flight of stairs approximately 10 days prior uh, was referred uh, initially seen at the hospital and referred to one of our providers here. The fracture of the is left uh, displaced by a fracture. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have this. I, we had a CT in the OR to upload. It's better showing this uh, displacement. This was a CG from the trauma team here. We decided to script, scan her for 10 days prior for her crew fractures. Uh, she had a uh, glenoid and scapula or F. That's okay. I uh, did a judet. And then actually we made a little arthrotomy and posterior aspect of the shoulder to align up our, our glenoid. Uh, next is can you go back? To, can you go back to that risk case, the um, the first case? 
you did a closed reduction. I didn't see the films. Was that not reduced? It is, it was open fire. Oh, you took it to the same day to the operating room? Uh, it was uh, four, or five hour, four or five hours later, uh, case came in the middle of the night. Oh, okay. So initially the, the resident call, I uh, just watched it out originally, you know, did a very nice reduction. If it had not been an open fracture, I, we would have accepted that. Next is a 51 year old male who's involved in MBC with the right posterior wall tabular fracture. That are delineated on the that cat scan. Second the hour of the following morning for uh, right ass tabulum or right up. Post your approach. Next is 16 year old uh, male is involved in MEC with bilateral femoral shaft fractures and the uh, only shaft fracture we found later on in secondary. It's actually occurred about a mile from my house. Um, this was one of his the, uh, pictures from the newspaper of his car. Left femur. Uh, he, had, uh, he went underwent bilateral femur retrograde eye nails. And then uh, the next day when he was extubated uh, during a secondary survey, he was known to have some wrist pain, uh, actually showing a right on shaft fracture, which was placed in the issue of So, uh, uh, what, two things. Why is a 16 year old driving? Was he driving illegally? No, he was a passenger. Oh, okay. There were, uh, and then what are you? Kids, four kids uh, involved in this car. They were hit by this truck that you can see in kind of the edge of the picture. Um, knowing that road is 50 miles an hour each way, so it's very high energy injury. I believe he was a front seat passenger. Uh -huh. Okay. And then post op. What, what's his weight bearing plan and what's his DVT prophylaxis in a 16 year old? Um, he was weight bearing tolerant by a lot of lower extremities. Uh, he was not weight bearing on that on the ulna. Uh, he was able to weight bear through the elbow and then DVT prophylaxis. I believe we gave him a not to be treated him as, a, as an adult. What's the so mortality? Sorry, there was two people speaking. Was that? Uh, Dr. Pushelin. How, <laughs> how long are you keeping him with the DVT prophylaxis? Uh, I believe right now the plan was uh, approximately three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. Uh, I believe we might have to extend it just because he hasn't really been mobilizing too much. Uh, he's actually going to be going to Chilton Specialized just to, from his problem with getting up and moving. I'd like to see him more ambulatory before we stop his DVT prophylaxis. Have to put two screws proximally in that band. This the one. On this one? Probably not. What's the mortality rate with bilateral thermal shaft fractures? Ten percent. I actually don't know. Fifty. Because most of them die in the scene. Yeah. So you could tell that to him and his parents if he ever complains about my knee hurts a little bit. <laughs> what's the rate of ARDS, Serge? Serge, what's the rate of ARDS at uh, fevers? Actually, not sure. Bilateral ones? I don't think that. It, it might vary depending on if you have a other blunt, a trauma to the chest. He actually had no other injuries, uh, any rib fractures or anything like that. Next, the 57 year old male uh, with a reported known stress fracture. This is a physician from New York. Uh, he had, uh, in August, he had greatly increased his running distances, generating pain in his femur. Uh, ordered an MRI and himself found this. Uh, what was reported as a distal femoral stress fracture was seen by an orthopedist and offered surgery, which she declined. Uh, he was supposed to get a uh, knee brace uh, to use with his crutches, which she never got, and then slipped with his crutches and sustained distal femoral fracture. Doctors make the worst patients. Are they still getting out Darwin works? <laughs> so you anyway, uh, right knee brace right now. <laughs> 
a chance to, did you have his pre injury films? Did he have access to them? I didn't have. I would love to see them too. Yeah. It's, a, it's an odd location for a stress <laughs> fracture. I've actually seen that though. It's not, it's not unheard of. But we worry, would you worry to consider a metabolic workup in it at some point? Uh, we did the send metabolic vibes on him. I don't recall on my head what uh, what page came back, but we did send full metabolic panel just because it's like you said, it's a little bit of an odd location for a stress fracture. Like you said, it's not unreported, but generally the tunnel shaft stress fractures, if they're not dysphosphates are more central. The, yeah. the athletic ones are more mid. Exactly. And next is a 33-year-old male who is involved in a low-speed motorcycle crash. He says under 25 miles an hour. With these bilateral severe plateau fractures, initially seen outside the hospital and then transferred here. <coughs> CAT scan is obtained just to, at the outside hospital to show the fractures. <coughs> was taken the following day for right to plateau or F and a left to plateau or F. How much or F did you do on the right? What was that? How much or F did you do on the right? Uh, we did tamp up that surface, um, and we were able to dial the piece back. Uh, and then we did, uh, the missus was detached from the capsule, so we reached out to the capsule. Uh, next is a 59 year old uh, female who is a pedestrian struck with this left segmental tibial shaft fracture. Uh, it's taking the over the following day for the studio. Uh, I am now. Next is 65 year old male, stand trip fall with right trimal ankle fracture. It's closed reduced in the ER. It's taken the following day for right ankle or F. Uh, he is a diabetic, and so we opted to use the just the distal fibula augment plates. Uh, next is a 31 year old female who dropped her coffee cup off her cane wall, jumped down five feet to grab the coffee cup. Uh, she's significantly more of a, uh, she's morbidly obese, it stands right trimal ankle fracture dislocation. She was closed to use in the ER and underwent an ankle ORF following day. Impressive. Yeah, well. Yeah. Um, posterior. Posterior. Oh, it's posterior. Yeah, it's posterior. Yeah. Uh, next is an 81 year old female, uh, St. fall with a left bilateral from an ankle fracture. It's close to reduce in the ER and taking the following day for an ankle or yeah. Again, she was a severely healthy product. It's a very, very poor pattern quality. So we also elected to use a, a locking plate and then uh, also put in a, a um, synthesis Moses screw on her. Thank you. I think that screw out really good in. Probably the in the in the set the longest screw.